Good evening, everybody. My name is Karen Bloor. I'm a professor of health economics and policy in the Department of Health Sciences at the University of York, and I'm the university's research champion on health and well-being. I'm here to chair this evening's event, and today's lecture is part of the University of York's online well-being lecture series. Although in a different format, through our open lectures, we continue to aim to enhance York's rep reputation as a city of ideas and innovation through offering the highest caliber of public events. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy the interesting talk this evening. A few technical notes first. If you're watching live, please ask any questions using the Q&A button on your screen. This is going to be available throughout the talk, so questions can be asked at any time. If you have any technical issues, if you lose your Wi-Fi or, or get kicked out some or drop out of the event, you can rejoin using the original link. Please remember that today's event is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch again on YouTube in a few days' time. If you're on Twitter, do please join in the conversation and use the hashtag York Ideas. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Marcus Harrington. Marcus is a research associate within the Department of Psychology at the University of York. His research focuses on the relationship between sleep and cognition, and he's involved in projects looking at sleep deprivation and memory control, as well as REM sleep and memory processing, subjects which are very relevant to considering how we might retain information after learning. Marcus's research also explores the effects of sleep deprivation on our vulnerability to depression. I'm absolutely delighted that Marcus is here today to guide us in examining the benefits of obtaining an adequate amount of sleep and the consequences of skipping sleep for our cognitive and emotional well-being. I'll be back to take your questions later, but for now, over to you, Marcus. Okay, so tonight I'm going to be talking to you about sleep and the amazing effect that sleep can have on memory. Then I'll tell you a bit about the consequences of sleep loss for both our memory and our mental health. And in doing so, I'll draw on some of the sleep deprivation studies that we've conducted in our sleep lab at the University of York. And finally, I'll discuss a groundbreaking technique that's currently being tested in labs all around the world, which might change the way in which we sleep in the future. So I'll just start off with a very brief history of how people have thought about the relationship between sleep and memory in the past. So probably the earliest known reference to a beneficial impact of sleep on memory was made almost 2000 years ago by the Roman educator Quintilian. And he said that it is a curious fact of which the reason is not obvious that the interval of a single night will greatly increase the strength of the memory. Whatever the cause, Things which could not be recalled on the spot are easily coordinated the next day. And time itself, which is generally accounted one of the causes of forgetfulness, actually serves to strengthen the memory. So it was perhaps quite bold of Quintilian to say that it is a fact that sleep benefits memory, when presumably he didn't have any empirical evidence to back up this claim. However, it turns out that Quintilian wasn't far wrong. And it's since been demonstrated through rigorous scientific testing that sleep does indeed benefit our ability to learn and remember new information. It's probably the earliest empirical evidence um, that's been published, as far as I know, um, that sleep benefits memory retention emerged in 1924. And in this study, participants were each shown 10 nonsense syllables, and each syllable was displayed for 0.7 seconds. The participants were divided into two groups. Um, there was a sleep group and a wake group. And after learning the nonsense syllables in the evening, participants in the sleep group went home and slept for a total of eight hours. Whereas participants in the wake group who learned the nonsense syllables in the morning went about their day as usual. All of the participants then reported back to the lab where they were asked to recall as many of the nonsense syllables as they could. Now participants who stayed awake between learning and test were able to recall on average less than one of the nonsense syllables that they'd learned earlier that day. Remarkably, however, the participants who slept between learning and test recalled on average more than five of the nonsense syllables. 
So this study showed that people can remember five times more nonsense syllables after a sleep-filled delay compared to an equal delay of wakefulness. This result supports Quintilian's view that the interval of a single night will greatly increase the strength of the memory. However, the role that sleep plays in memory retention was still unknown. Did sleep actively benefit the retention of the nonsense syllables? Or is it simply the case that sleep prevented the nonsense syllables from being forgotten by sheltering them from interference, which occurred in the wake participants who went about their day as normal? In a somewhat more recent study conducted in 2006, researchers sought to answer this very question. Specifically, they wanted to know whether sleep passively protects memories from being forgotten, or if sleep actively contributes to the overnight strengthening of memory traces. In this study, participants first learned 20 completely unrelated nouns, such as tiger shoe, blanket village, and car sheep. So alike in the previous study from 1924, participants were assigned to either a sleep group or a wake group. In the sleep group, participants learned the word pairs in the evening, and the wake group learned the word pairs in the morning. Now, after a 12 hour delay, which of course contained overnight sleep for participants in the sleep group, but consisted purely of wakefulness for participants in the wake group, all of the participants came back to the lab for a memory test. In the memory test, participants were presented with the first word of each word pair, and they were asked to type the second word from each word pair. As you might expect, based on the results from the previous study, the researchers found that the participants who slept between learning and test were better at recalling the second word pair, second word from each word pair. Um, so this result um, mirrors the, the results that I showed you from the study from 1924 and demonstrates that memories are better retained across sleep compared to wakefulness. So how did the researchers examine whether sleep offers passive protection against forgetting or if sleep actively strengthens recently learned memories? Well, the clever part about this study is that there were another two groups of participants who once again either slept or stayed awake between learning and test. However, these two groups of participants completed an extra learning task just before the final memory test. In this extra learning task, participants once again saw the first word from each pair that they had previously studied in the original learning task 12 hours, later, 12 hours earlier. However, this time the words were paired with a new word. This new word was designed to interfere with the original memory trace, which can be expected to have a negative impact on memory for the original word pairs. If sleep passively protects memories against forgetting, then we would expect the negative impact of interference learning to be identical in the sleep and wake groups. However, if sleep plays an active role in memory consolidation, then we would expect the impact of interference learning to be much less pronounced in the sleep group compared to the wake group. What the researchers found was that interference learning had a devastating impact on memory for the original word pairs in participants who stayed awake between learning and test, but it had a much less severe impact on memory for the original word pairs in participants who slept. This study elegantly demonstrated that rather than passively protecting memories from being forgotten, sleep actively consolidates memories and renders them less susceptible to interference from subsequent learning. What you might be wondering now is if sleep doesn't benefit memory by simply shutting us off from the outside world, then what is it about sleep that's so beneficial for memory? The first thing to know is that sleep isn't just one setting. Rather, sleep is composed of four different settings, which we refer to as sleep stages. Sleep is typically recorded using a method known as polysomnography, where tiny electrodes are attached to a person's scalp and face. Um, so typically in our lab, we'll attach eight electrodes to the person's scalp, um, one beside either eye and three on the chin, um, and also some reference electrodes. Um, and the electrodes that are attached to the scalp record electrical activity being emitted by brain cells or neurons as they communicate with each other. And the electrodes attached to the face record eye movements and also muscle tone. And by integrating all of the information from all of these different electrodes, we can segregate sleep into its four distinct stages. So typically a researcher will, um, after recording a night of sleep from a participant, will look at the data on a screen in 30 second segments or epochs, and they'll decide um, based on the activity in the participant's brain, which stage of sleep they're in. Um, so that'll either be wakefulness, um, stage one of non-REM sleep or non-rapid eye movement sleep, 
stage two of non-REM sleep, stage three of non-REM sleep, which we also refer to as slow wave sleep or rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. So REM sleep is probably the, no, the most well-known stage of sleep, and it tends to dominate the second half of the night, and it's associated with the subjective experience of dreaming. Now, when we're in REM sleep, our eyes, our eyes dart around rapidly behind our closed eyelids, hence the name rapid eye movement sleep. However, perhaps more interestingly, when we're in REM sleep, our brains are very active, and this gives rise, rise to a pattern of brain activity that is very similar to that seen during wakefulness. Now, as you can see, the electrical activity recorded from the brain during REM sleep is composed of low amplitude mixed frequency signals. Now, although it's likely that REM sleep plays some important role in overnight memory consolidation, the true hero of memory consolidation is the deepest stage of non-rapid eye movement sleep, which we refer to as slow wave sleep. Now, slow wave sleep dominates the first half of the night and it's associated with brain waves that are very different from those seen during REM sleep or wakefulness. As you can see, slow wave sleep is associated with high amplitude, low frequency brain waves, which are often referred to as slow oscillations. Embedded within the peaks of these slow oscillations are one second bursts of high frequency activity called sleep spindles. Together, slow oscillations and sleep spindles are thought to be the primary driving force behind memory consolidation during sleep. Now, what you might be wondering now is how do slow oscillations and sleep spindles drive memory consolidation. So when we initially learn new information, it's harbored within a seahorse shaped structure embedded deep within the brain called the hippocampus, which you can see in red on this graphic. The hippocampus acts as a short term memory store. Whilst memories are in the hippocampus, they're susceptible to interference from new learning, as we saw in the study from 2006, when learning the new word pairs interfered with memory for the original word pairs. As such, memories need to be transferred to a long-term memory store called the neocortex, where they're less susceptible to interference and they can endure for weeks, months, years, or even entire lifetimes. Slow oscillations, together with other faster, spindle, to other faster oscillations that occur during non-REM sleep, such as sleep spindles, are thought to drive the transfer of information from the temporary store, the hippocampus, to the long-term store, the neocortex. And in doing so, Sleep integrates new learning with existing knowledge and renders our recently learned memories less likely to be forgotten. Now studies like the ones that I've talked about so far have offered us a good understanding of how sleep benefits memory. But what happens to memory when we don't sleep? So it's been shown several times that a night of total sleep deprivation, as you might expect, compared to a night of sleep, can lead to an increase in forgetting. However, what we don't know is whether extended periods of sleep loss accelerate forgetting compared to typical periods of wakefulness, such as a normal day from, say, 7 a.m. until 11 p.m. In our research group, we designed an experiment to address this question. We first came up with two alternative hypotheses. Our first hypothesis was that a night of sleep deprivation will increase forgetting compared to a night of sleep but the rate of forgetting will not exceed that seen during a normal day of wakefulness. Our second hypothesis was that a night of sleep deprivation will increase forgetting compared to a night of sleep, but the rate of forgetting will exceed that seen during a normal day of wakefulness. Essentially, we want us to know whether something happens to our brain when we're sleep deprived that makes us more susceptible to forgetting. So we recruited a group of healthy undergraduate participants who agreed to take part in two separate conditions a sleep condition and a wake condition. The two conditions were separated by an interval of one week and half of the participants completed the sleep condition first, whereas the other half completed the wake condition first. In the sleep condition, participants completed a learning task in the evening, whereas in the wake condition, they completed the same learning task in the morning. During the learning task, all participants viewed 120 adjective image pairs for five seconds and we told them to remember the association between the adjectives and the images to the best of their ability. Now, importantly, half of the images were objects like the butterfly that you can see here, and the other half were scenes. Immediately after learning, participants then completed an immediate memory test where we showed them the adjectives that they saw during the learning task mixed in with 60 new adjectives that they hadn't seen before. 
Participants first had to indicate whether they remembered seeing the adjective from the learning task. If they said no, they couldn't recall seeing the adjective, then they immediately moved on to the next trial where another adjective was presented. If they said that they could recall seeing the adjective, they were asked whether they thought that the adjective was paired with an object or a scene during encoding. This allowed us to examine how sleep or wakefulness affected memory for single units of information, but also how it affected the connections between memories. This made our memory task more true to life than the previous studies that I've discussed, because recollecting complex events or experiences, or what we refer to as episodic memories, depends on our ability to remember how memories fit together. So after a night of sleep in the sleep condition or a day of wakefulness in the wake condition, participants were tested again on their ability to remember adjectives and the images associated with those adjectives. To measure memory, we measured the amount of information that participants forgot between the immediate memory test, which took place immediately after learning, and the delayed memory test, which took place after a 12 hour delay of either sleep or wakefulness. First of all, we looked at the proportion of adjectives that were forgotten across the delay. We found that unsurprisingly, in the wake condition, participants forgot more adjectives compared to in the sleep condition. Next, we looked at the proportion of memory connections that, we've, that were forgotten. So as you remember, that was the images connected to the adjectives that were presented. And we found that memory connections were forgotten to an equal degree across the sleep and wake conditions. This result suggests that um, memories are forgotten in an all or none fashion across a normal delay of wakefulness compared to a night of sleep. So in other words, although we're more prone to forgetting single units of information across a day of wake compared to a night of sleep, our ability to remember the connections between memories remains intact. So in other words, memories don't fragment. So having established the amount of forgetting that occurs across a normal day of wakefulness and a night of sleep, we next turned our attention to the effect of sleep deprivation. We recruited a new group of participants who completed two conditions in the same way that I've just described. However, in this experiment, the learning task took place in the evening in both the sleep condition and the sleep deprivation condition. So in the sleep condition, participants went home to sleep for the night, whereas in the sleep deprivation condition, they stayed awake all night in the psychology department under the supervision of a researcher. Now, importantly, caffeine wasn't allowed, so this, it wasn't easy for them, and napping wasn't allowed either. Um, so although participants stayed awake all night in the sleep deprivation condition, the time between learning and test was identical in all of the conditions. So it was always 12 hours, whether that was across a night of sleep or a day of wakefulness or a night of sleep deprivation. Therefore, if the rate of forgetting is the same across a night of sleep deprivation and a day of wakefulness, we would expect the results of these two conditions to be identical to the ones in the previous conditions that I've just talked about. However, if sleep deprivation accelerates forgetting compared to normal wakefulness, we would expect more forgetting to occur in the sleep deprivation condition. So again, we looked at the proportion of adjectives that were forgotten across the delay. And remarkably, we found a huge increase in forgetting across the sleep deprivation condition compared to the wake condition. In fact, there was a 50% proportional increase in forgetting in the sleep deprivation condition. So to put that into perspective for the students who might be listening, um, this could be the difference between getting a first in your exam and badly failing your exam. So it's probably never gonna be a good idea to stay up all night cramming for exams. Next, we looked at the proportion of memory connections that were forgotten. So as you'll remember, memories were forgotten in an all or none fashion across a day of wakefulness compared to sleep in the previous study. However, in this study, a night of sleep deprivation led to a large increase in forgetting of memory connections. So sleep deprivation didn't just increase the rate of forgetting for single units of information, the adjectives. It changed the qualitative nature of forgetting and it caused memories to fragment. So this study clearly demonstrates that prolonged atypical wakefulness does something to our brain that is fundamentally bad for memory. However, memory isn't the only thing that suffers when we lose sleep. Sleep loss can also have a major impact on our mental health. So it's quite well known that there is a connection between sleep loss and psychiatric disorders. I'm sure that many of you will be familiar with the experience of losing sleep as a result of worry. So when we're stressed, anxious, or nervous about something, 
it can be hard to rid our minds of racing thoughts, which makes it difficult to sleep. It will probably come, to no, come as no surprise to you then that psychiatric disorders such as anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder can cause people to lose sleep. Interestingly, however, rather than being caused by psychiatric disorders, sleep loss can also be a cause of psychiatric disorders. Disturbed sleep is a formal symptom of most psychiatric disorders, including major depressive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, as many as 90% of depressed patients report disturbed sleep. Often, sleep disturbance precedes the onset of depressive symptoms, and it's now widely agreed that sleep loss can play a causal role in the development of psychiatric disorders. What we don't know, however, is exactly how or why sleep loss promotes the onset of psychiatric disorders. What is it about sleep loss that makes people susceptible to problems such as major depressive disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder? So it's been shown several times that sleep deprivation can impair people's ability to cancel an action, such as a motor response. So to demonstrate this, we can use a task known as the go-no-go task. In the go-no-go task, participants are told to hit the space bar as quickly as possible whenever they see a known stimulus appear on the screen, for example, a green rectangle. However, they're told to avoid hitting the space bar whenever they see, for example, a red triangle. Participants are then shown a green triangle very often, so they get into the habit of hitting the space bar quickly at the beginning of each trial. Then, when a red triangle appears, they must inhibit their response. So instead of performing the motor action of hitting the space bar, they have to cancel the planned motor action. Now, several studies have shown that when people are sleep deprived, they're more likely to hit the space bar for no-go items, so the red triangles in this example, compared to when they're well rested. So in other words, sleep deprivation impairs our ability to cancel an action. We reasoned that just as sleep deprivation impairs the ability to cancel an external action, like a motor response, it might also impair the ability to cancel an internal memory process, like memory re retrieval. So as you probably all know, post-traumatic stress disorder and major depressive disorder are both, char both characterized by the presence of persistent, unwanted, and troubling thought intrusions. We hypothesized that sleep deprivation might give rise to persistent, unwanted thoughts, which might make people more susceptible to developing psychiatric disorders. To test this hypothesis, we performed an experiment which used a variation of the go-no-go -no -go task called the think-no-think -no -think task. We recruited a group of participants who learned a set of face scene pairs. Half of the scenes were emotionally negative, whereas the other half were neutral, like the example shown here. These face scene pairs were presented several times and we made sure that participants were easily able to visualize the scene associated with each face. So basically they saw each face scene pair for six seconds and then we showed them the faces on their own. And we said to them, um, when you see the face, can you, visually, can you fully visualize the scene that is associated with this face? And if they said no, they were shown that face again um, and quizzed later on. And if they said yes, they were asked to prove it by selecting the correct scene out of a choice of three different scenes. And we did this twice. Um, and after every trial, participants saw the correct face scene pairs again. So basically participants definitely knew the associations between the two. When they saw the face, they could always visualize the scene that was associated with that face. And so after the face scene pairs had been learned, half of the participants slept all night in the lab whereas the other half of the participants stayed up all night in the psychology department with me. Um, again, no caffeine or napping was allowed. Uh, most of the participants um, watched Netflix, um, read, did their work, that just normal, normal student stuff really. Um, the next morning, participants completed the think no think task. And in this task, some of the faces from the learning phase the night before were presented in a green frame. When faces were presented in a green frame, participants were asked to visualize in as much detail as possible the scene that was associated with the face on the screen. However, some of the faces were presented in a red frame. When faces were presented in a red frame, participants were asked to actively avoid thinking about the scene associated with the face on the screen. 
They were asked to do this by making their mind go blank rather than replacing the unwanted thought with another image, thought or idea. Um, if the scene came into the participant's mind automatically, we asked them to actively push that image out of mind and work to keep it out. Now, after every trial, participants were asked how often they thought about the scene associated with the face immediately after the trial on a scale from one to three. So a rating of one means that the participant never thought about the scene at all during the trial. So this is, of course, what the participants were trying to do during the no-think trials or the, the trials where the face was presented in a red frame. However, it wasn't always that easy. Um, and if participants did think about the scene automatically, um, then they gave a rating of two or three, corresponding to thinking about the scene either briefly or often. So a rating of two or three for a no-think trial or a red frame face trial meant that the participant tried to avoid thinking about the scene, but they were unable to do it. So when a participant gave a rating of two or three for a no-think trial, this was called a, a thought intrusion because the participants tried to keep it out of mind, but they were unable to do so. Now, these intrusions are what we were interested in testing. And we hypothesized that sleep deprived participants would have more of these thought intrusions compared to the participants who slept. And that is exactly what we found. So this test was administered in five blocks and all of the five blocks are identical. And as you can see, the sleep deprivation group who are shown in blue here, um, reported more intrusions in every single trial block compared to the participants who slept. Now, an interesting thing to note about this graph is that participants experience less intrusions with each trial block, um, which suggests that repeatedly inhibiting or suppressing an unwanted thought makes it less likely to intrude in the, in the future. And we calculated the rate at which participants improved across the five trial blocks. And we found that not only did sleep deprivation um, make people more likely to experience um, intrusions, but participants in the sleep deprivation group were also slower to improve at the task across trial blocks. So in other words, intrusions were more frequent. Intrusions were not only more frequent when participants were sleep deprived, but they were also more difficult to budge. Now, before the learning task in the evening and after the think no think task the following morning, participants were asked to rate how emotional they found each scene that appeared in the think no think task. Now, previous work has shown that repeatedly suppressing an emotionally negative scene in the think no think task, and you'll remember that half of the scenes were emotionally negative in this study, can make them seem less negative. So in other words, suppressing a memory can take away its negative emotional tone. We wondered if that was the case in this experiment. So we looked at the change in emotion ratings from the negative scenes from the evening session to the morning session after the think no think task. We found that for the no think scenes, participants who experienced fewer intrusions felt more positive about the scenes in the morning session compared to the evening session. Whereas the opposite was true for participants who experienced more intrusions. So in other words, effectively suppressing a negative memory or thought makes it seem less negative when we re-encounter it in the future. We next wondered whether sleep deprivation had any impact on this effect. And remarkably, the sleep deprived participants um, had no change in their emotion ratings for the negative no think scenes from the evening session to the morning session, meaning that they felt just as negative about the negative scenes after they'd suppressed them as they did the night before. However, the rest of participants felt significantly more positive about the negative no think scenes in the second session compared to the first. Now this result suggests that sleep deprivation not only impairs the ability to keep unwanted thoughts out of mind, but it also negates the benefit of thought suppression for our emotional well-being. Now together, these results clearly demonstrate that sleep loss could give rise to the symptoms of psychiatric disorders, such as PTSD and major depression. Firstly, sleep loss might prevent people from keeping unwanted thoughts out of mind. As a consequence, sleep loss might prevent people from downregulating the negative emotional tone associated with negative or potentially traumatic memories. So I hope by now that I have convinced you of the benefits of sleep for your cognitive and emotional well-being. There are a lot of things that you can do to improve your sleep, such as keeping your bedroom cool, 
um, going to bed and waking up at the same time every day, um, avoiding caffeine in the evening, that kind of thing. However, I figure if you want to find out more about that, um, you could probably find out from a quick Google search. So instead, I thought I'd tell you about an emerging tool for improving the efficiency of sleep. Um, so you won't be able to use this tool tonight to make you sleep any better, um, but this tool is uh, currently being tested in labs around the world. And I assume that it may be available for home use in the future. So you'll remember that I told you about slow oscillations. Slow oscillations are high amplitude, low frequency brain waves that occur during deep non-rapid eye movement sleep. These oscillations are the superstars of memory consolidation. And they're thought to drive the transfer of knowledge from a short-term store into a long-term store. The tool that I want to tell you about is a stimulation technique known as auditory closed loop stimulation. Auditory closed loop stimulation is basically an algorithm. And this algorithm monitors the electrical activity of the brain recorded via electrodes. When the algorithm spots a slow oscillation, it delivers very brief pulses of auditory stimulation that sound like clicks. And these clicks are timed to occur during the peaks of slow oscillations. These clicks increase the likelihood that another slow oscillation will follow the one that has been detected by the algorithm. So essentially, closed loop stimulation creates trains of memory enhancing slow oscillations. Here's an example from a study that we conducted in our York sleep lab. So these two lines are brain waves recorded via electrodes. And the red line represents the average of participants in a stimulation condition where auditory closed loop stimulation was delivered. And the gray line represents participants in a placebo or a sham condition where no auditory stimulation was delivered. The dotted red lines represent the time the auditory clicks were delivered in the stimulation condition. And as you can see, the clicks induced a train of three slow oscillations in the stimulation condition, which didn't occur in the sham condition where no auditory stimulation was delivered. You might also remember that I talked about sleep spindles which are around one second bursts of high frequency activity that occur during the peaks of slow oscillations. Sleep spindles help slow oscillations to consolidate memories. As you can see from this figure, they're also boosted by auditory closed loop stimulation. By boosting people's brain waves while they sleep, we can increase their ability to consolidate memories overnight. So in one study from 2013, where the concept of auditory closed loop stimulation was first introduced, it was shown that stimulation improved the overnight retention of related word pairs. This effect has since been replicated several times in many different labs, proving that we can quite reliably improve people's memory using non-invasive stimulation. As well as boosting memory, it's also been shown that auditory stimulation can improve functioning of the immune system, suggesting in the future the stimulation technique might not just make us smarter, but it could also save lives. So with that bold statement, I'll finish. Um, feel free to follow me on Twitter for kind of semi-regular updates on developments in the sleep science literature. Um, please visit the Epoch Lab website where you can see a list of the papers that we've published, including the ones that I've talked about today. Um, thank you for listening, and I'm more than happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Marcus. That was fascinating. And in, you know, in, in, in a real lecture theatre, we would have waves of rapturous applause at this point. <laughs> so I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to ask you all to, um, to imagine that just now. <laughs> but, um, fantastic um, list of questions um, going from right, right from the beginning of your, of your lecture. So um, loads to talk about. I'm sure we won't have time to get them all in, but we'll, we'll do our best and we'll certainly have, have a shot at it. So um, I've tried to group them a little bit, at least the ones early on, um, that, that, that system will no doubt fall apart um, completely in, in the next five minutes. But there are a few, first of all, on sleep deprivation and the health effects of sleep deprivation. Mm -hmm. So um, Becky asked, what if anything is understood about the effects of very prolonged sleep deprivation, for example, untreated sleep apnea? Chris um, asked, said that he was currently doing one all-nighter a week to keep on top of work and could this have any consequences long-term? 
Um, Tracy asked what effect it has sleeping seven or eight hours in the day and being awake all night. And um, Michelle asked how we can repair the damage done by sleep deprivation. So would you like to have a shot at any of those? Okay, so... consequences of sleep deprivation? Yeah, the first one, health... Do anything about it? Yeah, uh, what was the first one specifically again? Uh, the first one was um, what, if anything, is understood about the effects of very prolonged sleep deprivation. Okay. Um, so something like sleep apnea long term. Um, so it's hard to test the effects of very long term sleep deprivation in the lab because, unsurprisingly, ethics boards don't really let us keep <laughs> people awake for much longer than kind of 36 hours, um, something along those That's lines. Um, I think the world record for staying awake is something like 12 days. And I think it was a, a high school student who did it for a science fair project or something like that. Um, I believe that there were no long-term health consequences for him, but I mean, it's certainly not a good idea to, um, to try that. Um, sleep apnea, I understand can have a negative impact on memory. Um, so that's quite, understudied at the moment, but there's actually a PhD student in our, um, in our research group called Tom Hunter, who is doing research into sleep apnea and it, the effect that that has on memory. Um, so I'll be excited to find out the results of those studies. Great, thank you. So um, Chris, Chris Taylor mentioned that he was doing one all night or a week at the moment to stay on top of work. And I think from your from your findings on memory, perhaps he's not doing himself any favours there. Yeah, I, I don't think he could possibly be doing himself any favours by doing that. Um, yeah, I think it's it'd be much better to have kind of a regular sleep-wake rhythm. Um, I think he'd find that he would actually be able to get more work done if he didn't have that one all night or every week. Um, okay. So yeah, if you don't have to, then don't do it. Um, shift um workers have notoriously poor health um and they're more susceptible to a whole load of um diseases that non-shift workers don't get um so yeah avoid it if you can i would say <laughs> okay thank you there were um a few questions on sleep and age and um, basically how does the requirement for sleep change age. Um, one person asked about, um, George asked generally about the requirement of sleep with age. Yeah. Um, and, and another attendee asked, do you really need less sleep as you get older? Um, and she is only getting four to five hours a night, uh, worried about the impact on health. And okay. Um, so it's very well known that um, people as they get older have less sleep time and they report generally lower sleep quality. Um, it's a debate as to whether these people get less sleep because they don't need as much sleep. We don't need as much sleep when we get older to do the activities that we do. Or if as we get older, our brain actually loses the ability to generate sleep. Um, so that is a big unknown. However, there's some interesting research emerging about, so in the talk, I, I mentioned that um, sleep spindles occur during the peaks of slow oscillations. And when we're very young, these, um, the alignment of spindles and slow oscillations is kind of off. And then as we get a little older, the alignment is a lot better. So the spindles are much more likely to occur during the peaks of the slow oscillations where we want them um, for enhancing memory. However, as we age, they become misaligned again. And it's thought that this misalignment might underlie um, the, the kind of notorious memory deficits that come with old age. So that's a, a theory that's kind of being tested at the moment, but um, I can, reassure you that there is definitely a lot of work going into helping to understand the relationship between sleep and aging and trying to understand whether
people need less sleep when they're older or if there's anything that we can do to to benefit sleep so the the stimulation technique that i talked about Hmm. um that's been trialed in older adults um to try and try and uh boost the sleep that older adults are able to get and there has been some success um so we're not able to boost um oscillations in older adults as well as we can in younger adults but it does seem that it can be done um so it can have some benefit so that might be the future of um sleeping for older adults okay that's good to know so sticking with age um for just just for another minute um one of our um attendees asked whether there was any research on older older teenagers and sleep efficiency so, Older teenagers. Uh, yeah, do, do teen. I mean, I guess student age, perhaps, um, or first year, first year undergrad um, um, age. Are they? So, um, it, do, do do teenagers need more sleep, and do they suffer more if they're getting less sleep? I, I guess that's the, the question. Um, so the vast majority of research on sleep and memory actually comes from this age group um, because it's very convenient for us researchers who work at universities to recruit students who might be willing to sleep in the lab for in exchange for money. Yeah. <laughs> um, so most of what we know about sleep and memory comes from student populations. Um, and I think it's definitely the case that um, older teens um, have a definite preference for kind of later bedtimes and later wake times. Um, and I think this, this comes from kind of even young adolescence and kind of fade, fades out a bit um, as, as we get older. Um, but there's been a lot of debate over whether schools should be starting later than they do. Um, so by asking um, school students to get, to get in by nine o'clock, we might be asking them to to get up a lot earlier than that in order to get into school in time. Mm. Um, and in doing so, we're kind of uh, disrupting younger adults' kind of natural, uh, natural rhythm, where, mm. where, uh, where we're imposing a circadian cycle on them, which isn't necessarily what they're biologically, uh, what they need biologically. Um, so there's, yeah, there's been huge debate about this recently, and I think there's been some successes in some parts of the country in starting schools later and finishing later, so that students have a, a, a better chance to get the sleep that they need to facilitate learning. That's fascinating. Should we do the same in universities? Is it going to affect the older, older, well, you know, older but young people? Um, same, would you say? Yeah, I don't see why not. <laughs> Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. (laughs) Cool, thank you. Um, Let's see, what should we have next? Um, There's a few questions about wearable tech, Fitbits and all of that kind of thing. Uh Um, So um, they, um, yeah, this one claims it can track my sleep pattern and my sleep quality and um, misty um, and at least another one or two um, attendees asked how accurate they are, whether these, whether um, these recordings have yeah, any... Yes, so I wear one of these myself. Um, and according to this, I get an average of four minutes of stage three sleep every night. Um, now, I know that is not true because I have slept in a sleep lab myself with the full shebang. Um, and I know that my sleep is actually normal. Um, yeah, these things are notoriously bad at recording sleep. Um, okay. If, if they were good. Is that REM? Huh? Is it REM sleep, your stage three? Or is that uh, no, so that's deep, that's deep non-rapid sleep. eye movement sleep. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, uh-huh. yeah so they, they usually, they'll record sleep using the accelerometer. And I think some of them also use heart rate data. Um, and yeah, they, they, they're not good. <laughs> um, I think they, they're okay at deciding what time you went to bed and what time you got up. Yeah. But in terms of breaking it up into the different sleep stages, um, yeah, it's, it's really bad. If, if they were good, then we wouldn't go to the trouble of sticking um, loads of electrodes all over our, pat- our participants' heads when we get them in the lab. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe... Um, 
the I wouldn't read too much into it. I bet I bet doctors are kind of sick of people yeah. going into their offices and saying like, "Oh, I'm not sleeping properly." Um, <laughs> Look yeah. at this. Look at this chart <laughs> on my Fitbit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if we if we if we want to um, accurately divide sleep into its different stages, you really need EEG data. So you don't necessarily need like. 60 electrodes or whatever but mm -hmm. i mean at least a, a few to be able to be accurate with it <laughs> okay just going back to your sleep lab uh, one of our one of our um attendees um around you, you've already said that that most of the sleep lab participants are are, are undergraduates they're they're students basically um and have there been these kind of experiments on on, on older people as well retired people and and other, other groups of the population? Um, so we don't, I don't think it's been done in our sleep labs um, with older adults, but it's certainly been done in other places. Um, I think we have had sleep studies in children in our sleep lab. Um, so Sleep Smart, which is a research group at the University of York, they um, they do testing on children, um, some really cool stuff looking at how sleep benefits language learning in children. Um, and they have a lot of, um, yeah, children having, I don't think they've slept overnight in the lab, but they've certainly done a lot of nap studies. Um, yeah, they do some some really cool work. But yeah, no, no older adults in our sleep lab, I don't think. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, there was another one about napping, seeing as you've mentioned it. Yeah. Um, how if it, do you recommend it? How effective is napping, if it, particularly if you don't have a good night's sleep? Um, yeah, so there have been, there's been a lot of research on napping um, because it's, I, well, I assume the main reason why is because it's a lot easier to collect data from participants who have a daytime nap compared to staying awake all night um, while they sleep. Um, and napping is very beneficial for memory um the studies show it um it can have a negative impact on overnight sleep i think mm -hmm. um but I, I i i don't not recommend it <laughs> okay yeah i think it there's it's thought that um humans used to have a biphasic sleep cycle meaning that we had a lot a large chunk of sleep overnight as we do now but then we'd sleep for one and a half hours or two hours in the afternoon. And that's um, theory supported by the fact that quite often after lunch, you kind of have a dip in your cognitive ability. Um, mm. I'm sure people will have noticed that. Um, and yeah, it's thought that, that we have that because as kind of an evolutionary hangover from the biphasic sleep that we used to have. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. If you can, if you can afford to nap, then then do it by all means. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good idea. Um. So related to that, Kelly asked a question about does waking up halfway through sleeping and then going back to sleep again does it matter? Does it harm your sleep quality? Um. I mean, if you're you're kind of losing out on on the sleep that you would have had while you were awake, I guess, which isn't any good for your sleep. Um, but I mean, if you're naturally waking up and then just going to sleep again, I can't see it having any major impact. Okay, good. Um, and there's a couple of questions about the, um, the auditory closed loop clicky thing. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's a better word for it than that. Um, but um, one or two people asked how we could improve our sleep patterns, whether there are, you know, whether these things are something you can buy. Um, is it something that we should all, you know, we should all think about? Um, can we just use a metronome? Um, and are there any negative consequences of this kind of thing? Okay. Uh, so what was the first one? Could, oh, yes. Can we do it at home? Um, so unfortunately, no. I, I mean, I think there was one study where they um, use it in in the participants' homes uh, using kind of portable polysomnography equipment. Um, it's not it's not kind of commercially available. 
but I imagine in the future it could be. So it's quite, it'd be quite a, a difficult thing to kind of have something that you could wear that could track your sleep on the go and detect the right times to deliver mm. the stimulation. So we kind of, when we do this in participants, we have them spend a night in the lab first, a kind of adaptation night where we look at their um, slow oscillations and determine the right time to deliver the clicks. Um, so it's quite an ask to get kind of a portable device that can adapt to each, each person's natural brain oscillations to deliver the stimuli at the right time. Um, interestingly though, it's not just auditory stimulation that can achieve this effect. So um, there was a paper published recently showing that if, um, if you sleep in a bed that rocks in time with your oscillations, that can have a similar effect. So it can, it can boost um, your non-rapid eye movement brain waves. Um, it's also been done using electrical stimulation. So if, if you uh, deliver a uh, electrical current through the brain at the time to the peaks of the slow oscillations at the same frequency as slow oscillations, so about 0.75 Hertz, um, you can enhance brain waves in a similar way. And it's also been done using magnetic stimulation. Uh, so by delivering a strong magnetic pulse in time with slow oscillations, we can enhance them as well. Um, yeah, so I imagine none of these things are, you, you, you certainly shouldn't be applying electrical stimulation to your brain um, off your own back, but maybe this is something that will be available in the future. I hope it will be. Time. Yeah, but at the moment it's, it's just okay. in labs. <laughs> Oh yeah, and you asked if it might have any negative impact. Um, yeah. So that's a really good question. And it's something that we really don't know. So obviously humans have evolved for, from, for millions of years. And by, by messing with the, the finely tuned um, thing that is sleep, are we, are we going to have any negative impact? And I'm really not sure. So Obviously, we're, we can boost memory doing this. We can also boost the ability to learn. So if you learn something and then have this auditory stimulation, it'll improve your memory for the stuff that you learn. But also, if you have the auditory stimulation and then learn something, it'll improve your ability to, to learn. Um, and mm -hmm. also, as I mentioned, it can increase, um, increase the functioning of your immune system. So it doesn't seemingly do anything bad for immune function, but sleep does a whole load of things. It's easier to say, um, it's harder to say what it doesn't do than what it does do. So it's, it's mm. really, it is a really good question um, about whether when main, we're potentially meddling with something that shouldn't be meddled with when we do this. Mm. And it's something that I imagine will be researched in great detail in the future. So this this has only really taken off recently. So the first paper on this was in 2013. And since then, there's been okay. loads of research looking at it. And I imagine that in the coming years, we're gonna learn a whole lot more about it. Okay, fascinating. Look forward to it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so many questions, so many questions. Um, let's go to your um, fascinating study of, of um, the, the one about sleep and intrusive thought. Because mm -hmm. um, there are a few questions around that one. Um, uh, one person said that, asked, asked whether you think that repressing thoughts in something like OCD would have the effect of reducing them longer term. So is this short term effect something you think would, would remain longer term? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, in our study, we looked at the after effects of memory suppression on the emotional response to the memory that was suppressed. Um, but this field of research has consistently shown that not only does suppressing a memory reduce the emotional tone associated with that memory, but it can also um, dampen the memory trace altogether. So 
there's something called suppression induced forgetting where if you repeatedly suppress a memory you're more likely to forget it right so um whether it's an effective strategy in mental health um is mm. a matter of debate um so obviously some therapists some some therapy is kind of geared towards discussing um negative memories and negative experiences mm. but other therapists will tell you to avoid thinking about negative experiences with the intention of um kind of erasing these memory traces or dampening the emotional tone of the memory traces mm -hmm. so it's really a matter of debate as to whether in the long term it's an effective strategy for um for avoiding mental health issues so our work shows that you can um, effectively reduce the emotional tone associated with um, negative experiences and sleep deprivation impairs your ability to do that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really a thing of debate whether this even relates to kind of repressed memories and that kind of thing. Right. So I think that partially answers the, the next question, which was from Amanda. Um, she asked, if suppressing a negative emotion means that we feel ne less negative about the situation, does that mean that counselling, which encourages talking about negative experiences, might increase trauma? So I think I think perhaps you're saying that's still up for debate. Yeah, I think it's a thing of debate. I mean, there are, there are two trains of thought on this. Um, kind of the the therapy that we all know about is kind of this therapy where you think about traumatic um, events and try and kind of uncover them and come to terms with them. Um, but yeah, this is, this is kind of a, a different, a different look at that, I guess. And yeah. I, I don't know whether this was related to repressed memories. If it's, it's unknown whether repressed memories are caused by people repeatedly suppressing memories when they come to mind. So I'm not sure mm. if the two, if repressed memories are related to kind of what we're studying here. Okay, okay thanks. Um, let's take a few more, if that's if that's okay with you, Marcus. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of people have asked about dementia and Alzheimer's. Shanaz asked whether lack of sleep can lead to dementia or Alzheimer's. And Ilana asked whether the knowledge from, from studies like yours on memory and sleep can help to reduce dementia. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, so dementia and sleep loss go hand in hand. So quite often um, sleep loss is attributed as a contributing factor to dementia. And it's thought that, a lot, so when, when we sleep, we kind of clear our brains of um, unwanted or unuseful um, neurochemicals. And when, when we don't sleep, there can be a buildup of plaques that are associated with dementia, such as beta amyloid. Um, and this amyloid is kind of like a thick, sticky plaque, which builds up. And as it builds up, it can actually undermine the ability to generate effect, effective and efficient sleep. Um, so sleep loss can not only be a cause of dementia, um, but as sleep loss takes hold, it can, um, it can undermine the ability to produce effective sleep, which can then you know, increase symptoms of dementia even more. So reduce the ability to consolidate memories and it prevents sleep from doing all the great things that it does for us cognitively, um, which yeah can certainly um, manifest as dementia. And does your um, your closed loop stimulation does that have any um, any chance of being used in future to do anything about it? Slow it down. I, slow I down very much hope so. Like um, it would be amazing if it can um so there's no there's no research into this yet i don't think mm -hmm. i don't think people have tried to use auditory closed loop stimulation to benefit 
um, memory or enhanced sleep and dementia yet, but I'm sure it's coming. And I really hope that it works. It would be great. There is work showing that um, the alignment of um, spindles and slow oscillations um, is related to the buildup of plaques associated with dementia. Um, and it's possible that using auditory stimulation, we might be able to realign um, oscillations and spindles, which could potentially prevent the development of dementia, but hopefully also do something to, to help people who have dementia. Yeah, as you say, fascinating. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be a thing? Yeah, that would be great. Um, couple of questions on oversleeping. Do, do you, is it possible to sleep too much? It's as far as I know. Eight or nine hours um, a day and, you know, feels feel like they need eight or nine but is that too much? As far as I know, there's no good evidence that you can oversleep or that oversleeping is bad for you in any way. Um, so there is some, some uh, correlational evidence showing that, so people who don't sleep are more prone to a whole load of bad things. Um, and people who oversleep are also prone to these bad things. But it's unknown if people who already have these bad things sleep more because they have the bad things, or if they've developed these bad things as a result of sleeping too much. Um, but as far as I know, there's no good causal evidence that you can sleep too much. Um, obviously, if you're in bed for kind of, you know, 12 hours a day, or whatever, you're not being very active during that time, which is not necessarily going to be good. Uh, there is some uh, research showing that people with psychiatric disorders like depression, um, not only can they have insomnia where they can't sleep or they don't sleep enough, but they can also have hypersomnia where they're sleeping way too much. Um, but I think it's been shown that these people are not necessarily sleeping for a long time. They're just spending a lot of time in bed. Um, okay. So yeah, I, I don't think that you can sleep way too much. Certainly, nine hours doesn't sound too bad. I think. Um, nine hours sounds alright to me. <laughs> yeah, I think we're recommending eight, eight, eight to nine hours. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. There's a couple of questions about dreams as well. Mm -hmm. So one person said that, that they they regular had regularly have sort of nine hours sleep, but still wake up exhausted because they've had very um, vivid dreams, and someone okay. else ask about whether exper experiments within lucid dreaming can lead to a better understanding of human consciousness. I don't know whether you want to tackle, yeah. tackle either of those. Oh, wow, big one. <laughs> um, so I haven't actually done any research on dreaming. Um, so I have read a, quite a bit about it. Um, so it's exceptionally hard to study dreaming. And I really take my hat off to the researchers who do study it because it is very hard. Um, so I've spent a lot of time staying up all night, um, stimulating people's brains, that kind of thing. Um, but the people who research dreams are staying up all night and they're going into the participants' room, waking them up, asking for a dream report kind of 10 times a night, that kind of thing. Um, and then they have to, uh, so they record the dream report and then they transcribe the dream report and then they have to analyze mountains of data um, and yeah, it sounds like a real nightmare. Um, whether, so the, there was uh, the question about sleeping, feeling exhausted as a result of dreaming too much. Um, so it's, it's kind of deep non-REM sleep that's thought to um, really make you feel refreshed when you wake up. Um, so, if someone was to get a lot of REM sleep, um, it, it is possible that they could wake up not feeling refreshed. Um, however, I don't think it's that common for people to have kind of too much REM sleep. Um, there are some uh, medications, uh, so a lot of antidepressants, that kind of thing. They increase the amount of REM sleep that people have. Um, or they can also go the other way and 
massively decrease the amount of REM sleep that someone has. Um, and it's thought that that might be a mechanism of their action. So by reducing the amount of REM sleep someone has, it might uh, be what makes them feel better. Um, but to the person who asked the question about sleep in nine hours and waking up feeling exhausted, that might be something to see a GP about. I'm not sure that could be sleep apnea or something like that. Okay. Okay. I think, I mean, we're getting, yeah, it's nearly 10 past eight now. I'm going to ask you one more question, which is okay. from, from, from now. And um, now ask, did you get a good, good night's sleep last night? Did I? I didn't get a good night's sleep. Prior to, um, I was up early this morning and I went on a first aid training course and then I came back and I was rushing around for this. No, I didn't get a good night's sleep. I was quite nervous about this as well. I thought there might be some technical issues, but it's gone okay. Yeah, it has, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> well, despite your not good night's sleep, you've done a fantastic lecture. Oh, a really thank you. Fascinating talk, talk. Thank <laughs> you so much for that. And also for such a, you know, such great, great answers to all of the questions. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> So thanks to everyone in the audience. Um, wish I, I wish I could see you all. Um, thanks for taking part and for the, the terrific questions. I'm sorry we've got so many of them that that's still unanswered. Um, follow follow Marcus on Twitter and ask ask him them on Twitter. That's all I can suggest. There were yeah. loads of questions, far far more than we could get through. So um, which is a reflection on how interesting your lecture was and how and how fascinated we all are by the topic of sleep. Um, just before I go, um, I'd like to um, mention two other well-being lectures this term. So please join us for um, one on perfectionism, the hidden epidemic, on Wednesday, the 11th of October at 7 p.m. And one entitled No Drugs, that's with a K-N-O-W. Um, so No Drugs on Tuesday the 17th of November at 7 p.m. and there's more information on on those and all of the other um, public lectures that we that we have at york.ac.uk forward slash events so again thank you Marcus please imagine rapturous applause and thanks, <laughs> thanks everyone you. for joining in have a good evening thanks a lot <laughs>